Mrs. Bealbrow's Lions from Miss Bracegirdle and Others by Stacey Armonier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. Mrs. Bealbrow's Lions Mrs. Pulteney Bealbrow is the kind of woman who drips with refinement. Everything else has been squeezed out of her. Even her hair, which once was red, has been dried to a rusty grey. Her narrow face is pinched and bloodless, the lines of her figure blurred by shapeless and colourless materials, as though she resented any suggestion of organic functioning, as though blood itself were not quite nice. The voice is high-pitched, toneless, ice-cold. She speaks with dead monotony, without enthusiasm. And yet one can hardly describe Mrs. Bealbrow as a woman who has not had enthusiasms. Lions! Lions have been the determining passion of Mrs. Bealbrow's life. A life amidst lions can hardly be called an apathetic life, you might say. I would like to have known Mrs. Bealbrow when she was young, though the condition is difficult to visualise. She is now that indeterminate age which aesthetic women sometimes arrive at too soon and forsake too early. She might easily be in the mid-thirties. On the other hand, she might be in the late forties. Even later, even earlier, she is so refined, you see. You can imagine her doing nothing so vulgar as visiting the Royal Academy or reading a popular magazine. As for the cinema or a review, oh, my dear! It is only her eyes which sometimes give you an inkling of a restless soul. They are almost green with a tiny grey pupil. She sometimes smiles with her lips, but never with her eyes, which are always roaming, searching, lions. She was a Mrs. Pulteney, you know, the Hull shipping people, and she married Bealbrow the stockbroker. God knows why. You can seldom find Bealbrow. Sometimes you may observe him standing against the wall at one of those overpowering receptions she gives. He is tubby, genial, and negative. He smiles at his wife, busily occupied with lions, and mutters, Wonderful woman, my wife, wonderful. Then he retires to the refreshment room and waits on people. Everyone will tell you that Mrs. Bealbrow was once a remarkably talented violinist, though we have never met anyone who has heard her play. She certainly knows something about music, and can talk shiveringly about every ancient and modern composer of note, in addition to many composers without note. But do not imagine that her discriminations are confined to music. She shivers about architecture, sculpture, painting, and literature. She dissects tone poems, eulogizes discords, subdivides futurism into seven distinct planes, considers Singe too professional, professes a pallid admiration for Bach when performed in an empty church, is coldly contemptuous of the Renaissance, dislikes Dickens, Scott, Zola and Tolstoy, in spite of the latter being Russian and a lion. By the way, everything Russian exerts a curious influence over her, Russian and Chinese. Things Japanese she condemns as bourgeois. She is enormously refined, a sybarite of aesthetic values. She has no children, but she keeps a marmoset, a bordsoy, five chows, two smoke grey Persian cats, a parakeet, and some baby crocodiles in a sunk tank in the conservatory. The latter she keeps because they remind her of the slow movement of some sonata by Sibelius. But it is of the lions she keeps that we would speak. They are not real lions, of course. Real lions are peculiarly commonplace, reminiscent of Landseer and the zoological gardens. 
Mrs. Bealbrow's lions roar in drawing rooms and concert halls. They are mostly indigenous to the soil of Central or Eastern Europe. She imports them from Russia, Bohemia, Hungary, Austria or Czechoslovakia. No other breeds are any good. Neither must they be popular in the generally accepted sense. If you say to Mrs. Bealbrow, I heard Chrysler play the Berkshire Coney very finely last night, she shivers and says, Ah, oh, but have you heard de Bork play the slow movement of the Schleskecki sonata? You weakly reply, No. The name of de Bork seems familiar, but you have never heard of him as a violinist. She leans backwards and regards you through half-closed eyes. Upon her face there creeps an expression of genuine sympathy. There is an almost imperceptible shrug of the shoulders, and she turns away. You mutter, damn, and also repair to the refreshment room, where Mr. Bealbrow waits on you. The refreshments are very good. He says, have you seen my wife? She's a wonderful woman, wonderful, um. We should mention that this um of Mr. Bilbro is a curious kind of low hum that he affixes to the end of every statement. It seems to deliberately contradict what he has just said. It's just like a genteel, I don't think. It is said that in the old days, Mrs. Bealbrow used to make a hobby of genuine lions, famous opera singers and painters. There is a full length of her by Sargent in the billiard room, a very good portrait too, if somewhat merciless. It is characteristic of her that it now should be in the billiard room, a room that is only used on the night of a great crush to deposit hats and coats that are crowded out of the cloakroom. Sergeant is passé. If you mention the portrait to her, she says, Ah, but have you seen the pastel of me by Splits? The pastel by Splits is in the place of honour in the drawing room. You suspect that it is meant to be a woman by the puce-coloured drapery and what appears to be long hair, or is it a waterfall in the background? She says of it, it is wonderful. Splits got into it the expression of all that I have yearned for and never achieved. You can feel the wavelengths of my thoughts vibrating esoterically. Good luck to Splits. I hope he got his cheque. The day came when Mrs. Bealbrow tired of genuine lions. They were a little disillusioning too businesslike, and too fond of being waited on by Mr. Bealbrow in the refreshment room. And so she said, I will make my own lions. She travelled abroad, taking with her the marmoset, two of the chows, one smoke-grey Persian cat, the parakeet, the crocodiles in a special tank, and Mr. Bealbrow. It was in Budapest that she discovered her first embryo lion. His name was Scratch. She heard him playing the fiddle in an obscure café. She went to hear him three nights running. On the third night she went up to him after the performance and she said, Come with me, I will make you a lion. Now, we are anxious to deal fairly by Scratch. He was young, talented, poor and hungry. He had the normal ambitions, desires, appetites and the weaknesses of the normal young man. He had often dreamed of being a lion, and after one or two beers he frequently persuaded himself that the accomplishment was not impossible. Nevertheless, he had never been blind to its difficulties. And here was a woman who came to him and said, Quite simply, I will make you a lion, in the same way that she might have said, I will cut you a liver sausage sandwich. How could you expect Scratch to take it? When he arrived in London, he impressed us as being quite a pleasant, amiable young man. 
He had a thin body, but rather puffy, sallow cheeks, jet black hair, and brown eyes. He was obviously at first a little apprehensive, suspicious. The eyes seemed to say, Oh, well, anyway, they can't eat me. He lived at Mrs. Bealbrow's and had what she called finishing lessons with a Polish professor. It was exactly a year before Scratch was launched into Lionhood. During that time, no one had heard him play a note. And yet, a most remarkable thing happened in connection with the launching. Months before Scratch appeared in public, the newspapers were always containing paragraphs about a remarkable young violinist shortly expected from Budapest, said to be a second Ize. Mrs. Bealbrow's drawing room was always crowded, but Scratch never played. He was introduced to all kinds of people and whispered about. I remember meeting there the critics of the... No, perhaps this kind of revelation is not quite fair. Anyway, when Scratch gave his first orchestral concert at the Queen's Hall, the affair had been so cleverly prepared that the place was packed. The press reviews were not eulogistic, were for the most part non-committal. Dogs are afraid to bark at a lion. It would be a terrible blunder to condemn a real lion. One must wait and see what the general verdict is. There is no denying also that Scratch did play very well. He was what is known as a talented violinist. One may assert without fear of contradiction that there were at that time in London probably thirty or forty violinists, leaving out of course a few supreme artists, equally as talented as Scratch but they had not the flair of lions. They just went on with their job, playing when an opportunity occurred, but for the most part teaching. The following day an advertisement appeared in the papers announcing that, owing to the colossal success of Herr Scratch's concert, three more would follow on such and such dates. The advertisement must have been sent in before the colossally successful concert took place. From that day forward, Scratch did indeed become a qualified lion. The more responsible papers certainly began to damn him with faint praise, and even to pull him to pieces. But if you assert a thing frequently enough, incessantly enough, and in large enough type, people will come to accept it. He became a kind of papier-mâché lion, and it didn't do the boy any good. For two years the hoardings and the newspapers reeked with advertisements and notices about the great violinist Scratch. And then he began to develop in other ways. From a slim, nervous boy, he rapidly became a robustious, self-assured, florid man. His body filled out, his cheeks reddened, and his hair grew unmanageable. He adopted an eccentric mode of dress. And Mrs. Bealbrow? The affair reacted upon her just as one might expect. She became more precious, more aloof, more impossible— she floated around the drawing-room with her protégé with an air which implied, Look at me, I'm the woman who made a lion. She wore a tiger-skin, and left Mr. Bealbrow at home to look after the livestock. And after the first flush of triumph and excitement, Scratch treated Mrs. Bealbrow with complete indifference and contempt. He left lighted cigar ends on the lid of the grand piano, spilt wine on the bed linen, walked about the house all day in a dressing gown, threw his boots at the servants and snubbed visitors. He would get up from table in the middle of a meal and walk out of the room without an apology. He was even rude to her in public, and she revelled in it. The ruder he was, the more delighted she appeared. She would glance round the room proudly, as much as to say, There, didn't I tell you I have made a lion? 
They went about everywhere together. They went to the opera, the theatre, to concerts and receptions, for motor rides in the country, and they were always alone. Mr. Bealbrow was very busy, you see, making money in the city. He had to do that to pay for Herr Scratch's publicity campaign. Of course people began to talk. They might have talked on much less evidence than they had. The thing was simply thrown at them. She glued herself to him, and he accepted her and what she gave him as only right and proper. Sometimes he would treat her with playful familiarity. He would put his arm around her shoulder and call her, Oh, girl! Oh, very well. But how old really was Mrs. Bealbrow? What was happening in the dark places of her heart? Of course it couldn't go on forever. We all shook our heads and were very wise, and we were right. It went on for nine months, and then Mr. Bealbrow... No, Mr. Bealbrow did nothing. He just sat tight, helped people to hot cup, and expatiated upon his wife's remarkable character and abilities. The disruption appeared from outside. Another woman appeared on the scene. Her name was Fanny Freelander. She was an accompanist. Now, if you had wanted to invent a complete antithesis to Mrs. Bealbrow, Fanny would have saved you the trouble. She was it. She was young, common, ignorant and frivolous, and at the same time she had emotional warmth. There was something sympathetic and lovable about her. She was not exclusively a man-hunter. She liked to be petted and admired. When she accompanied, she wore red carnations in her hair and cast glad, furtive glances at the audience and sometimes at the soloist who, of course, was Herr Scratch. Herr Scratch was not the kind of gentleman to make any bones about such a position. He flirted with her outrageously, even on the platform. Whether Mrs. Bealbrow made any protest about this affair at its inception is not known. By the time the infatuation was apparent, it was too late. Inflated by his meretricious success, he was in no mood to brook interference. Mrs. Bealbrow's face expressed little. I really believe she was rather fascinated by the girl herself. She seemed to be watching, a little bewildered and uncertain how to act. It ended in the three of them going around everywhere together, the usual and satisfactory triangle. The fact that she had to play his accompaniments was sufficient excuse for Fanny Freelander to go with him to concerts where he was playing and to call at Mrs. Bealbrow's for rehearsals, but hardly an excuse for her to go to the opera, the theatre and motor rides, or even to stop all afternoon at Mrs. Bealbrow's and then stay on to dinner. It was surmised that Mrs. Bealbrow only tolerated it because she knew that if she turned the girl out, Scratch would have gone with her. She appeared to be content with the crumbs the younger woman left over. Ah, but only for the moment we were convinced. At that time, as if conscious of his delinquency, Herr Scratch was a little more polite to Mrs. Bealbrow, whilst the girl made no end of a fuss of her in a loud, common way that must have jarred the good lady's sensibilities horribly. We waited to see what would happen next, what would be the next move of Mrs. Bealbrow to rid herself of this dangerous rival. To our surprise, a few weeks later the girl went there to live, she was actually living in the Bailbrow's house. Was there ever a queerer menage a quatre? There was Mrs. Bealbrow, the lion hunter, badly mauled by one of her own lions, entertaining her most dangerous enemy. 
She must have shut her eyes to all kinds of things. Scratch was behaving abominably. The girl was not the kind you could trust anyway. There was Mr. Bealbrow, quite negative, merely earning the money to support the absurd drama. "'It's incredible,' said Jimmy Beale one night in the club, "'that a woman as conceited as Mrs. Bealbrow is "'could possibly put up with such a damned indignity. "'It's making her look the prize fool of London.' "'Love is more powerful than a sense of dignity,' "'remarked some sententious bore from the corner. "'Love, well, an unanalyzable quantity.' I was perhaps the only one fortunate enough to have the opportunity to judge of the denouement by any practical evidence, and even then it was only a fluke, a glance. It occurred a few nights before Scratch disappeared. Some say he went back to the obscure café in Budapest, taking the girl with him. It is hardly likely, in view of the handsome door which someone presented to Fanny, it was at one of Mrs. Bealbrow's most overwhelming crushes. You could not hear yourself speak for the roar of lions. I was squeezed against the folding doors. Behind a palm in the corner was an empire mirror tilted at an angle. It was about the only thing I could see. It gave me a good view of certain people a little farther down the room. The first person I saw was Mrs. Bealbrow, and as I glanced at her, I saw an expression come over her face, an expression I can only describe as one of blind jealousy, a nasty, vindictive, dangerous look. Ho, ho, I thought, and sought for the reflection of Fanny or Herr Scratch. But to my astonishment, I realised very clearly that her glance was not directed at those two at all. She was looking at Mr. Bealbrow, whose wicked, malevolent little eyes were fixed on Fanny's. Scratch, for the moment, was occupied with some other woman. You might have imagined that the defection of Scratch would have broken Mrs. Bealbrow's heart for the business. But, oh dear, no, don't you believe it. Whatever you may say or think about Mrs. Bealbrow, she has proved herself to be a true and indomitable lion-hunter. Only last Thursday I was again in her crowded drawing-room. A little East End Jewess was playing the piano quite nicely. Mrs. Bealbrow was standing by the folding doors, her face set and taut. When the child had finished, she murmured, Ah, oh, if Teresa Carreño could have heard that! Teresa never reached that velvety warmth in her mezzo passages. I believe the child must be the reincarnation of... Who would it be? Liszt? No, someone more southern, more Byzantine. I will make her a lion. In the refreshment room, Mr. Bealbrow was ladling out hot cup as usual. When I approached him, he said... Hello, old boy. Have some of this. Good. Have you seen my wife? She's a wonderful woman. Wonderful. End of Mrs. Bealbrow's Lions. A Man of Letters from Miss Bracegirdle and Others by Stacey Armonier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. A Man of Letters Alfred Codling to Annie Phelps My dear Annie, I got into an awful funny mood lately. You'll think I'm balmy. Comes over me like late in the evening when it's getting dusky. It started, I think, when I was in Egypt. Nearly all of us chaps it was out there felt it a bit, I think. When you was on sentry go in the desert at night, it was so quite a mysterious. You felt you wanted to know things, if you know what I mean. Since I've come back and settled in the saddlery again, 
I still feel it most always. A kind of discontented funny feeling, if you know what I mean. Well, old girl, what I mean is, when we're spliced up and settled over in Tibblesford, I want to be good for you, and I want to know all about things and that. Well, I'm going to write to Mr. Weeks, who's a gentleman, and who lives in a private house near the church. They say he's a literary society, and if it be so, I'm on for joining it. You'll think I'm balmy, won't you? Tisn't that, old dear. Me that has always been content to do my job and draw my screw on Saturday and that, you'll think me funny. When you've lived in the desert, you feel how old it all is. You want something, and you don't know what it is, perhaps just to improve yourself and that. Anyway, there it is, and I shall write to him. See you Sunday. So long, dear. Alf. Alfred Codling to James Weeks, Esquire. Dear Sir, Someone tells me you are a literary society in Tibblesford, in which case may I offer my services as a member and believe me your obedient servant, Alfred Codling. Pendred Castaway, Secretary to James Weeks, Esquire, to Alfred Codling. Dear sir, in reply to your letter of the 27th inst, I beg to inform you that Mr. James Weeks is abroad. I will communicate the contents of your letter to him. Yours faithfully, Pendred Castaway. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling My dear Alf, you are a funny old bean. What is up with you? I spec you are just fed up. You haven't had another touch of fever, have you? I will come and look after you Sunday. You are a silly to talk about improving, considering the money you are getting, and another rise next spring, you say. I expect you got fed up in the desert and that, didn't you? I expect you wanted me sometimes, eh? I shouldn't think the literary society much caught myself. I can lend you some books. Cook is a great reader. She has nearly all Ethel M. Dell's and most of Charles Garvis. She says she will lend you some if you promise to cover in brown paper and not tear the edges. They had a big party here over the weekend. A colonel, a bishop, two gentlemen and some smart women, one very nice and she gave me ten bob. We could go to the pictures come Wednesday if agreeable. Millie is walking out with a fella over at Spindlehurst in the grocery a bit flash. I don't like him very much. Mrs. Vaughan had one of her attacks on Monday. Lord, she does get on my nerves when she's like that. Well, be good and cheerio. Must now close. Love and kisses till Sunday. Annie. James Weeks, Esquire, Malaga, Spain. To Alfred Codling. Dear yes, sir, my secretary informs me that you wish to join our literary society in Tibblesford. It is customary to be proposed and seconded by two members. Uh, would you kindly send me your qualifications? Yours faithfully, James Weeks. Alfred Codling to Annie Phelps. My dear Annie, Please thank Cook for the two books which I am keeping wrapped up and will not stain. I read The Eagle's Mate, and I think it's a pretty story. As you know, dear, I am no fist at explaining myself. At the pictures the other night, you were on to me again about getting on and that. Tisn't that. It's difficult to explain what I mean. I expect I will always be able to make good money enough. If you haven't been through it, you can't know what it's like. It's something else I want, if you know what I mean. To be honest, I did not like the pictures the other night. I thought they were silly, but I like to have you sitting by me and holding your hand. 
If I could tell you what I mean, you would know. I have heard from Mr. Weeks about the literary, and I am writing off at once. Steve, our foreman, has got sacked for pinching leather, been going on for years, so must close with love till Sunday. Alf. Alfred Codling to James Weeks, Esquire. Dear Sir, as regards your communication, you ask what are my qualifications. I say I have no qualifications, sir. Nevertheless, I am wishful to join the literary. I will be candid with you, sir. I am not what you might call a literary or educated man at all. I am in the saddlery. I was all through Gallipoli and Egypt, Lieutenant Corporal in the second fifteenth mounted Blumshires. It used to come over me like when I was out there alone in the desert. Perhaps, sir, you will understand me when I say it, for I find folks do not understand me about it, not even the girl I walk out with, Annie Phelps, who is as nice a girl a fellow could wish. Perhaps, sir, you have to have been thrower, if you know what I mean. When you are alone at night in the desert, it's all so big and quiet. You want to get to know things, and all about things, if you know what I mean, sir. So perhaps you will pass me in the literary. Your obedient servant, Alfred Codling. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling. Dear Alf, you was funny, Sunday. I don't know what's up with you. You never used to be that glum, I call it. Is it thinking about this literary sock turning your head, or what? Milly says you come into the kitchen like a boiled owl you was. Cheer up, old dear, till Sunday week. Annie. James Weeks, Esquire, to Alfred Codling. Dear sir, allow me to thank you for your charming letter. I feel I understand your latent desires perfectly. I shall be returning to Tibblesford in a week's time when I hope to make your acquaintance. I feel sure that you will make a desirable member of our literary society. Yours cordially, James Weeks. James Weeks to Samuel Childers. My dear Sam, I received the enclosed letter yesterday, and I hasten to send it on to you. Did you ever read anything more delightful? We must certainly get Alfred Codling into our society. He sounds the kind of person who would make a splendid foil to old Baldwin with his tortuous metaphysics. That is, if we can only get him to talk. Yours ever, J.W. Samuel Childers to James Weeks. My dear chap, you are surely not serious about the ex-corporal. I showed his letter to Fanny. She simply screamed with laughter. But of course you mean it as a joke, proposing him for the literary. Hope to see you on Friday. Yours ever, S.C. Alfred Codling to Annie Phelps. My dear Annie, I was afraid you would begin to think I was balmy. Dear, I always said so, but you mustn't take it like that. It is difficult to tell you about, but you know my feelings to you is as always. Now I have to tell you, dear, that I have seen Mr. Weeks. He is a very nice old gentleman indeed. He is very kind. He says I can go to his house any time and read his books. He has hundreds and hundreds. I have never seen so many books. You have to have a ladder to climb up to some of them. He is very kind. He says he shall propose me for the literary sock, and I can go when I like. He asked me all about myself, and that was very kind and pleasant. He told me all about what books I was to read, and that so I think, dear, I won't be going to the pictures Wednesday, but will meet you by the fire station Sunday as usual. Your loving, Alf. Ephraim Baldwin to James Weeks. 
My dear Weeks, I am afraid I cannot understand your attitude in proposing and getting Childers to second this hobbledy-hoy called Alfred Codling. I have spoken to him, and I am quite willing to acknowledge that he may be a very good young man in his place. But why join a literary society? Surely we want to raise the intellectual standard of the society, not lower it. He is absolutely ignorant. He knows nothing at all. Our papers and discussions will be Greek to him. If you wanted an extra hand in your stables or a jobbing gardener, well and good, but I must sincerely protest against this abuse of the fundamental purposes of our society. Yours sincerely, Ephraim Baldwin. Fanny Childers to Elspeth Pritchard Dear old thing, I must tell you about a perfect scream that is happening here. You know the Tibblesford Literary Society that Pa belongs to, and also Jimmy Weeks? Well, it's like this. Dear old Jimmy is always doing something eccentric. The latest thing is he has discovered a mechanic in the leather trade with a soul. I'm sure I ought not to spell it the other way. He is also an ex-soldier and was out in the East. He seems to have been imbued with what they call Eastern Romanticism. Anyway, he wanted to join the society, and old Weeks rushed Pa into seconding him, and they got him through. And now a lot of the others are up in arms about it, especially old Baldwin. You know, we call him Pomanganate of Potash. If you saw him, you'd know why, but I can't tell you. I have been to two of the meetings, specially to observe the mechanic with the soul. He really is quite a dear, a thick-set, square-chinned little man with enormous hands with a heavy silver ring on the third finger of his left, and tattoo marks on his right wrist. He sits there with his hands spread out on his knees, and stares at the members as though he thinks they are a lot of lunatics. The first evening he came, the paper was on the influence of Erasmus on modern theology, and the second evening, the drama of the Restoration. No wonder the poor soul looks bewildered. He never says a word. How is Tiny? I was in town on Thursday and got a duck of a hat. Do come over soon. Crads of love, fan. James Weeks to Alfred Codling My dear Codling, I quite appreciate your difficulty. I would suggest that you read the following books in the order named. You will find them in my library. Jevons' Primer of Logic, Welton's Manual of Logic, Brackenbury's Primer of Psychology, and Professor James's Textbook of Psychology. Do not be discouraged. Sincerely yours, James Weeks. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling Dear Alf, I don't think you treat me quite fair. You says you are sweet on me and that, and then you go on in this funny way. Tisn't my fault that you got the wind up in Egypt. I don't know what you mean by all this. I wish the old literary society was dead and finish. Cook say you probably want a blue pill you was so glum Sunday. Don't you see all these gents and girls and educated coves are pulling your leg if you don't know what they talking about and all that? You just making a fool of yourself. And then what about me? You don't think of me, and it's making me a fool too. Milly says she wouldn't have no truck with a book louse, so there it is. Annie. Alfred Codling to James Weeks, Esquire. Dear sir, I am much obliged to you for putting me on them books. It beats me how they work up these things. I'm afeard I'm not scholared enough to keep up the pace with these sayings and that. It's the same with the literary. I listen to the talk, and sometimes I think I've got it, and then no. Sometimes I feels angry with the thing said. I know the speaker's wrong, but I can't say I feel they wrong, but I don't know what to say to say it. There's some things too big to say. 
isn't that, sir? I'm much obliged to you, sir, for what you have done. Believe me, I enjoy the literary, though I almost always don't know the talk. I know who are the right ones and who are the wrong ones. If you've been through what I've been through, you would know the same, sir. Believe me, your obedient servant, Alfred Codling. Ephraim Baldwin to Edwin Jope, Secretary to the Tibblesford Literary Society. Dear Jope, For my paper on the 19th Prox, I propose to discuss the influence of Hegelism on modern psychology. Yours ever, Ephraim Baldwin. Edwin Jope to Ephraim Baldwin. Dear Mr. Baldwin, I have issued the notices of your forthcoming paper. The subject, I am sure, will make a great appeal to our members, and I feel convinced that we are in for an illuminating and informative evening. With regard to our little conversation on Wednesday last, I am entirely in agreement with you with regard to the quite inexplicable action of Weeks in introducing the leather mechanic into the society. It appears to me a quite superfluous effrontery to put upon our members. We do not want to lose Weeks, but I feel that he ought to be asked to give some explanation of his conduct. As you remark, it lowers the whole standard of the society. We might as well admit agricultural labourers, burglars, grooms and barmaids, and all the derelicts of the town. I shall sound the opinion privately of other members. With kind regards, yours sincerely, Edwin Jope. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling All right, then, you stick to your old literary. I am sending you back your wedding ring, and you go in and out of that place never thinking of me. Aunt said how it would be you going off and setter and getting ideas into your head. What do you care? I don't think you care at all. I expect you meet a lot of these swellheads there, men and women, and you get talking and thinking you someone. All these years you were away, I waited for you faithful. I never had a thought for other fellows, and then you go on like this and treat me in this way. Aunt says she wouldn't put up, and Millie says her book louse is worse than no good, and so I say good-bye, and that's how it is now forever. You have broken my heart, Annie. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling I cried all night. I didn't mean quite all I said, you know. How I mean, dear, off. If you was only reasonable, I don't mind you going to the literary if you explain yourself. For God's sake, meet me tonight by the fire station and explain everything. You're broke-hearted, Anne. James Weeks to Samuel Childers my dear Sam, I hope Harrogate is having the desired effect upon you. I was about to say that you have missed few events of any value or interest during your absence, but I feel I must qualify that statement. You have missed a golden moment. The great Baldwin evening has come and gone, and I deplore the fact that you were not there. My sense of gratification, however, is not due to Ephraim himself, but to my unpopular protégé and white elephant, Alfred Codling. I tell you, it was glorious. Ephraim spoke for an hour and a half, the usual thing, a dull rechauffe of Schopenhauer and Hegel, droning forth platitudes and half-baked sophistries. When it was finished, the chairman asked if anyone else wished to speak. To my amazement, the ex-lance corporal rose heavily to his feet. His face was brick-red and his eyes glowed with anger. He pointed his big fingers at Ephraim and exclaimed, Yes, talk, 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 that's all it is. There's nothing in it at all. And he hobbled out of the room. 
you know, he was wounded in the right foot. The position, as you may imagine, was a little trying. I did not feel in the mood to stay and make apologies. I hurried after Codling. I caught up with him at the end of the lane, and I said, Codling, why did you do that? He could not speak for a long time, and then said, I'm sorry, sir. It came over me like all of a sudden. We walked on. At the corner by Harvey's mill, we met a girl. Her face was wet. There was a fine rain pouring down at the time. They looked at each other, these two, and then she suddenly threw out her arms and buried her face on his chest. I realised that this was no place for me and, and hurried on. The next morning I received the enclosed letter. Please return it to me. Ever yours, James. Alfred Codling to James Weeks. Dear Sir, Please to erase my name from the literary sock. I feel I have treated you bad about it, but there it is. I apologise to you for treating you bad like this, that that is all I regret. You have always been kind and pleasant to me, lending me the books and that. I shall always be grateful to you for what you have done. It came over me sudden like last night, well, that chap was spouting about what you call physiology. I never heard tell on the word till you put me on to it. Now they all talk about it. I looked it up in the diction, and it says something about the science of mind, and that chap went on spouting about it. I had a quarrel with my girl. We had never quarrelled before, and I was very down about it. She is the best girl a fella could wish, and I have always said so. Somehow, last night, while he was spouting, it came over me sudden. I thought of the nights I had spent alone in the desert when it was all quite a mysterious and big. I had been through it all, sir. I had seen my pals what was alive one minute, blown to pieces the next. I had tramped hundreds of miles and gone without food and water. I had seen L itself, sir. And when you were always with death like that, sir, you were always so much alive. You are alive, and then the next minute you may be dead, and it makes you want to feel in touch like with everything. You can't hate no one when you are like that. You think of the other fella over there who's thinking like you are perhaps, and he all alone to looking up to the blinking stars, and it comes over you that it's only love that holds us all together, love and nothing else at all. And my heart was breaking thinking of Annie, what I had treated so bad, and what I had been through, and he went on spouting and spouting. What does he know about physiology? You had to have been very near death to find the big things. That's what I found out. And I couldn't tell those literary blokes. And that's why I lost my temper. And so pleased to erase me from the sock. They can't teach me nothing that matters. Cause I've seen it all and I can't teach them nothing because they haven't been through it. What I have learnt, sir, is that there's something big in our lives apart from getting on and comforts and good times, and so, sir, I am much obliged to you for all you have done for me, and accept my apology for the way I treat you. Your obedient servant, Alfred Codling. James Weeks to Edwin Jope Dear Jope, in reply to your letter, I cannot see my way to apologise or even dissociate myself with the views expressed by Mr. Codling at our last meeting. Consequently, I must ask you to accept my resignation. Yours very truly, James Weeks. Samuel Childers to Edwin Jope Dear Jope, 
taking into consideration all the circumstances of the case, I must ask you to accept my resignation from the Tibblesford Literary Society. Yours faithfully, S. Childers. Annie Phelps to Alfred Codling. My dear Alf, of course it's all right. I'm all right now, dear Alf. I will try and be a good wife to you. I am clever like you with all your big souts and that, but I will and be a good wife to you. Aunt Em is going to give us that horse's hair. Our mother says there'll be twenty-five pounds coming to me when Uncle Steve pegs out, and he has the dropsy all right already. What do you say to April if we can get that cottage of Mrs. Plummer's mother's? See you Sunday. Love from Annie. Kiss, 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 kiss. Ephraim Baldwin to Edwin Jope. Dear Mr. Jope, as no apology has been forthcoming to me from any quarter for that outrageous insult I was subjected to on the occasion of my last paper, I must ask you to accept my resignation. Yours faithfully, Ephraim Baldwin, OBE. Alfred Codling to Annie Phelps. My dear Anne, you will be pleased to hear they made me foreman. This will mean an increase, and so on. I think April will be all right. Mr. Weeks sent me cheque for fifty pounds to start farnishing, but I took it back, and I said no. I could not accept it, having done nothing to earn it and treating him so bad over that literary sock. But he said yes, and he put it in such a way that I accept after all, so we shall be all right for farnishing at the present. He was very kind, and he says we was to go to him at any time, and I was to go on reading the books. He says I shall find good things in them, but not the literary sock. He says he has left it hisself. I feel I treated him very bad, but I could not stand that fellow spouting, and him never having been through it like what I have. That dog of Charlie's killed one of Mrs. Reeve's chickens Monday, so must now close till Sunday with love from your soon husband. Don't it sound funny? Alf. Edwin Jope to Walter Bunning. Dear sir, in reply to your letter, I beg to say that the Tibblesford Literary Society is dissolved. Yours faithfully, E. Jope. End of A Man of Letters Face from Miss Bracegirdle and Others by Stacey Armonier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs Face it will not, of course, surprise you to know that it was at the Cravenford National School that he was first known as Face. The people of Essex are well known for their candour and lucidity of expression. He was an exceptionally, well, plain boy. There was nothing abnormal or actually malformed about him. It was only that his features had that perambulatory character which is the antithesis of classic. It was what the Americans call a homely face. The proportions were all just wrong, the ears slightly protruding, the jaw too lantern, the eyes actually too wide apart. Moreover, his figure was clumsy in the extreme. He seemed all hands and feet, knees and chin. It was impossible for him to pass any object without kicking it. Neither was his personality enhanced by his manner, which was taciturn and sullen, gauche in the extreme. The games and amusements of other boys held no attractions for him. He made no friends, exchanged no confidences, distinguished himself at nothing. 
Yet those of the impatient world who found time to devote a second glance to this uncouth exterior were bound to be impressed by the appeal of those deep brown expectant eyes. They were not essentially intelligent eyes, but they had a kind of breadth of sympathy, a profound watchfulness, like the eyes of some caged animal to whom the full functions of its being had not so far been revealed. It was the universality of this nickname, Face, which preserved it, for the boys of Cravenford National School knew that Caleb Fryatt resented it, and individually they feared him. That very clumsiness and imperviousness of his was apt to be overwhelming when adapted to militant purposes. Not that he was easy to rouse, but it was difficult to know when he was roused. He gave no outward manifestation of it, but when he was, it was difficult to get him to stop. He was a grim and merciless fighter who could take punishment with a kind of morbid relish. It only inspired him to a more terrible onslaught. The boys preferred to attack him in company, and then usually vocally, by peeping out over the churchyard wall and calling out, Faith! Faith! Oh my, there's a face! The tragic setting of his home life explained much. He had had a brother and two elder sisters, all of whom had died in infancy. He lived with his father and mother in a meagre, dilapidated cottage a mile beyond the church. His father worked at a stud farm, at such moments as the mood for work was upon him. He was a man of morose and vicious temper, quickened by spasmodic outbreaks of alcoholic indulgence. Of poor physique, he was nevertheless a dangerous engine of destruction in these moods, particularly in respect to the frailer sex. Caleb had been brought up in a code which recognised unquestioningly the right of might, which accepted tears and blows as a natural concomitant to its reckoning. He had stood powerless and affrighted at the vision of his little mother beaten unreasonably, almost to insensibility, and he had never heard her complain. His own body was scarred by the thousand attentions of sticks and belts. He, too, had not complained. In some dumb way he suffered more from the blows his mother received than he did from those he received himself. But he was growing up now, ugly, clumsy old face. When at the age of fourteen he passed through the first standard and out of school, he was already as tall as his father, and somewhat thicker in girth, more agile, tougher in fibre. The significance of this development did not occur to him at the time. He was sent to work at Sam Hurd's the blacksmith, a dour, intelligent, religious giant, who instructed him in the intricacies of his craft with relentless thoroughness, but without much sympathy. The boy liked the work, although he showed no great aptitude at it. He had a way of plodding on, appearing to understand, serving long hours, and then, in a period of abstraction, forgetting all that he had been told. He loved the blazing forge, the clang of metal upon metal, the sheen upon the carter's horses that came in to be shod, the sunlight making patterns on the road outside. He was two years with Sam Hurd's. At seventeen his muscles were like a man's, his overgrown hulking body like a fully developed farm labourer's. His appearance had not improved. Even the smith adopted the village nickname and called him Faith. At first it was Young Faith, and then Faith, and then, as their sombre familiarity developed, and the smith realised the boy's sound qualities, and the something far too old for his years, it became Old Faith. He knew that his assistant had no powers of adaptability, little invention, not a very real grasp of the essentials, 
But at the same time he knew he could trust him. He would do precisely as he was told. He would stick to it. He could be relied upon like a sheepdog. Nothing could shift him from his post of duty. The smith was right, but he had not allowed for those outward thrusts of fate which upset the soberest plans. One night Caleb arrived home and found his mother crying. He had never seen her cry before. He regarded her spellbound. "'What is it, mother?' Nothing, lad, nothing. Come, your tea's keeping warm upon the hob. There's a pasty. Nay, you wouldn't cry for night, mother. Lift up your head. She lifted up her head and dashed the tears away, but as she moved towards the kitchen, he noticed that she was trying to conceal a limp. He caught her up. He's been striking you again. It's nothing, lad. Show me. He pulled her down to him, and she wept again. Lifting the hem of her skirt, she revealed her leg above the ankle, bound up in linen. He kicked me, dear, but it's nothing. It will pass. Caleb ate his tea in silence. His table manners were never of the finest, and on this occasion he masticated his food and swilled his tea like an animal preoccupied with some disturbance of its normal life. Afterwards he sat apart and thought, his mother busy with household matters. Later she popped across the road to a neighbouring cottage to borrow some ointment. While she was out, his father returned. It was getting dark, and a fine rain was beginning to fall. His father came stumbling up into the cottage garden, singing. Caleb blocked his passage in the little entrance hall and said deliberately, "'You didn't ought to have kicked mother.' His father, emerging from the shock of surprise, scowled at him. "'What's that? You didn't ought to have kicked mother.' For a moment Stephen Fryatt was speechless. Then he lurched forward and pushed his son away. "'What's the devil it to do with you, whippersnapper?' Caleb thrust his father back against the wall and repeated, "'You didn't ought to have kicked her.' Then Stephen saw red. He struck at his son with his clenched hand and the blow split the boy's ear. Caleb took his father by his throat and shook him. The latter tried to bring his knee into play. At this foul method of attack, Caleb too became angry. Those long, powerful fingers gripped tighter. He closed up and flung his father's body against the lintel of the door. He did not realise his own newly developed strength. When his mother returned a little later, she found her man lying in the passage, with the back of his head in a pool of blood, her son hovering ghost-like in the background. She gave a cry. What's this she've done, Caleb? A hollow voice came out of the darkness. He didn't ought to have kicked ye, mother. She screamed, and kneeling upon the floor, she supported the battered head upon her knee. It appeared an unrecognisable thing, the hair so much blacker than the ivory-hued face, the eyes staring stupidly. Followed then a shifting phantasmagoria, scenes and emotions incomprehensible to the defender, Neighbours and doctors and policemen talking and arguing, whispering together, pointing at him. He was led away. In all that early turmoil, and in the more bewildering proceedings which followed, the one thing which impressed him deeply was the attitude of his mother. She had changed toward him entirely. She accused him, reviled him, even cursed him. He would ponder upon this in his dark cell at night. He never imagined that his mother could have loved his father. Not in that way, not to that extent. 
His brown, ox-like eyes tried to penetrate the darkness for some solution. He had no fear as to what they would do with him, but everything was inexplicable, unsatisfying. The days and weeks which followed, he lost all sense of time, added to the sense of mystification. He appeared to be passed from one judge to another beginning with a gentleman in a tweed suit and knickerbockers, and ending with a very old man in a white wig and gold-rimmed glasses, of whom only the head and the thin pale fingers seemed visible. Yes, yes, why did they keep on torturing him like this? He had answered all the questions again and again, always giving the same replies, always ending up with a solemn asseveration, he didn't ought to a kicked her. At the same time, he had never meant to kill his father. He had underestimated his strength. He'd become very strong in the forge. His father had attacked him first. It was unfortunate that the back of Mr. Fryatt's head had struck the sharp corner of the lintel post. He was in any case crazy with drink, the boy was only seventeen. He believed he was defending his mother. Of course, these pleas were not his. This version of the case had not occurred to him. But to his surprise, a learned-looking gentleman, who had visited him in his cell, had stood up in court and made them vehemently. And hearing the case put like that, Caleb nodded his head. He hadn't thought of it in that light, but it was quite true. Oh, but the arguments which ensued, the long words and phrases, the delays and pomp and uncertainty. Never once did the question seem to come up as to whether his father ought to have done it or not. According to his mother, his father appeared to have been almost a paragon of a father. It was all settled at last, and he was sent away to a home for two years. Home. The ironic travesty of the word penetrated his thick skull. Immediately he had passed what looked like a prison gate. There were two hundred boys in this home. It seemed strange to live in a home ruled over by a governor in uniform, policed by jailers and superintendents. Strange to have a home one could not leave at will, where iron discipline turned one out at dawn, drove one like a slave to long hours of hard and uncongenial work. Strange that home should breathe bitterness and distrust, that it should be under a code which seemed to repeat eternally, "'Don't forget you are a criminal.' Young as yet, but the taint is in you. It was true there were momentary relaxations, football and other games which he detested, bleak and interminable services in a chapel, organ recitals and concerts. The other boys disgusted him with their endless obscenities and suggestions, their universal conviction that the great thing was to get through it, so as to be able to resume those criminal practices inherent in them, practices which the home did nothing to eradicate or relieve. If old face had not been of the toughest fibre, dull-witted, impervious, and in a sense unwakened, those two years would have broken him. As it was, they dulled his sensibilities even more. They embittered him. Those brown eyes had almost lost that straining glance of expectancy, as though the home had taught him that there was nothing for him in any case to expect. He was a criminal, hallmarked for eternity. When he had been there six months, they sent for him to go and visit the chaplain. That good man looked very impressive, and announced that the governor had received information that Caleb's mother was dead, 
and that it was his solemn duty to break the news to him. He appeared relieved that the boy did not at once burst into tears. He then delivered a little homily on life and death, and pointed out that it was Caleb's evil and vicious actions which had hastened his mother's death. He advised him to pour out his heart in penitence to God, who was always our rock and saviour in times of tribulation. He quoted passages from Leviticus, and Caleb stared at him dully, thinking the while, I'll never see my mother again, never, never. He did not give way to grief. The news only bewildered him the more. He went about his duties in the home stolidly. He was quite an exemplary inmate, hardly up to the average standard of quickness and intelligence, but quiet, obedient, and well-behaved. At the end of his term of service, he was sent up before the governor and other officials. The clumsy scrawl of his signature was demanded on innumerable forms. He believed he was once more to be a free man. And so he was, in a qualified sense. But he was not to escape without the seal of the institution being indelibly stamped upon him. In roundabout phrases, the governor explained that he was to leave the home, but that he was not to imagine that he was a free agent to go about the world murdering whomever he liked. He was still a criminal, requiring supervision and watching. Out of their Christian charity, the governors had found employment for him at a timber merchant's at Bristol. Thither he would go, but he must remember that he was still under their protection. Every few weeks he must report to the police. Any act of disobedience upon his part would be treated, well, by a sterner authority. On the next occasion, he would not be sent to a nice, comfortable establishment like the home where they played football and had concerts, but to Wormwood Scrubs or Dartmoor. Did he understand? Oh, yes, Caleb understood, at least partly. He was to be free, free in a queer way. The arrangement did not exactly tally with his sense of freedom, any more than this building tallied with his idea of home. But he was only nineteen, and his body was strong, and his spirit not completely broken. Any ideas he may have entertained that the new life was going to spell freedom in any sense were quickly shattered. The timber merchant at Bristol was a man named Barnet, a tyrant of the worst description. He knew the kind of material he was handling. Most of his employees were ex-convicts, ticket-of-leave men, lascars or social derelicts. He acted accordingly. Caleb slept in a shed with nine other men, four of whom were coloured, they worked ten hours a day loading timber on barges. They were given greasy cocoa and bread at six o'clock in the morning, a meal of potatoes and little square lumps of hard meat at twelve, and then tea and bread at four o'clock in the afternoon. In addition to this, he was paid twelve shillings a week. The slightest act of insubordination or slackness was met with a threat here you! Any more of that, and you go back to where you came from. Before he had been there a month, he felt that the home was indeed a home in comparison. Strangely enough, it was one of the coloured men who rescued him from his thraldom, a pleasant-voiced coon with only one eye. He appeared to take a fancy to Caleb. One night he came to him and whispered, Say, boss, would you like to beat it? It took some time for the boy from Cravenford to understand the coloured man's phraseology and plan, but when he did, he fell in with it with alacrity. 
The following Saturday, they visited a little public house down by the docks and were there introduced to a grizzled mate. Hands were wanted on a merchantman sailing for Buenos Aires the following week. The coloured man was a free agent and he signed on, and Caleb signed on in the name of J. Bullock. Two nights before sailing, he hid in a barge and joined his ship the following morning. All day long he experienced the tremors of dread for the first time in his life. The primitive instinct of escape and the call of the sea was upon him. He could have danced with joy when he heard the rattling of the chains and the hoarse cries of the deckhand as the big ship got under way at dusk. The voyage to Buenos Aires was uneventful. The work was hard and the discipline severe, but he was conscious all the time of sensing the first draft of freedom that he had experienced since he left his village. This feeling was accentuated at port when he realised that after being paid off, he was free to leave the ship. But the rigid magnificence of Buenos Aires depressed him. He learnt that after unloading, they were to refit and convey cattle to Durban in South Africa, so he signed on again for the next voyage. This proved to be a formidable experience. A week out, they ran into very heavy seas. He was detailed to attend the cattle. The cattle superintendent was a drunken bully. The stench among the cattle pens, added to the violent heaving of the ship, brought on sickness, but he was not allowed any respite. The cattle themselves were seasick, and many of them died and had to be thrown overboard. The voyage lasted three weeks, and when he arrived at Durban, he determined to try his luck once more as a landsman. At that time, there was plenty of demand for unskilled labour for men of Caleb's physique in South Africa, but it was poorly paid. He drifted about the country doing odd jobs. He visited Cape Town, Kimberley and Peter Maritzburg. The fever of Vandalust was upon him. He never remained in one situation for more than a few months. He was the man who desired to see over the ridge. Perhaps further, just a little further, would be, he knew not what, some answer to the inexpressible yearning within him, deep calling unto deep. At the age of twenty-two, he was working on the railroad near Nyanza. They came and told him about the Great War, which had just started in Europe. A keen-faced little man, one of the gangers, tapped him on the shoulder and said, It's lucky for you, lad, you're out here. Otherwise they'd be telling you that your king and country need you. The phrase disturbed him. Night after night he lay awake, dreaming of England. Memories of the home and of the timber merchant at Bristol vanished. He thought only of Cravenford, the grey, ivy-coloured church, the rambling high street, the pond by Mr. Larry's farm, the crossroads where he and another boy named Stoddard had fought one April afternoon, his mother's cottage, now alas deserted but always sacred. Old Sam Hurd's banging away in the smithy. The rooks circling above the great elms in the park. All, all these things were perhaps in danger whilst he lay sulking in a foreign land. They had called him Face. Well, why not? He knew that he was not particularly prepossessing. The fellow workmen had always been at great pains to point this out to him. But still... Stolidly and indifferently he went about his work, and then, one day, in the old manner, he vanished. We will not attempt to record Caleb's experiences of the war. He had no difficulty in joining a volunteer unit in Cape Town, which was drafted to England. There, he asked to be transferred to one of his own county regiments. 
The request was overlooked in the clamour of those days. He found himself with a Cockney infantry regiment, and he remained with it throughout the whole course of the war. His life was identical to that of his many million comrades. In some respects, he seemed to enjoy lapses of greater freedom than he had experienced for a long time. He was better fed, better clothed, better looked after. He had money in his pocket which he knew not what to do with. He made a good soldier, doing unquestioningly what he was told, sticking grimly to his post, being completely indifferent to danger. Save for a few months on the Italian front, he served the whole time in France. He was slightly wounded three times, and in 1917 was awarded a military cross for an outstanding feat of bravery in bombing a German dugout and killing five of the enemy single-handed in the dark. Those queer spiritual strivings so deep down in his nature derived no satisfaction from the war. It was all quite meaningless and incomprehensible. When he left South Africa, he had an idea that the fighting would be in England. He visualised grim battles in the fields beyond Cravenford, and he and the other boys from the school defending their village. He had never conceived that a war could be like this. Sometimes he would lie awake at night and ruminate vaguely upon the queer perversity of fate which had suddenly made murder popular. He had been turned out of England because he had quite inadvertently killed his father for kicking his mother across the shins, and now he was praised for killing five men within a few minutes. He didn't know, of course, but... Perhaps some of those men, particularly that elderly plump man who coughed absurdly as he ran on to Caleb's bayonet, perhaps they were better men than his father, though foreigners, though enemy. It was very perplexing. After a grey eternity of time, the thing came to an end. He found himself back in England. During the war, much had been forgotten and forgiven. No one asked him for his credentials. The police never interfered with him. With his three wound stripes, his military cross, and his papers all in order, he was for a time a persona grata. He had a bonus beyond the pay which he had saved, and he had never been so wealthy in his life. He stayed in London, and tried to adapt himself to a life of luxury and freedom, but he was not happy. In restaurants he was self-conscious, in theatres bored, and in the streets bewildered. And so one day he set out and returned to his native village. Strangely little had it altered. There was the church, the smithy, and the old street, all just the same. He called on the smith, who was startled at the sight of him, but on perceiving his stripes and ribbons, reasonably polite. He ransacked the village for old friends. Alas, how many of his school associates had gone, never to return. He called on Mr. Green, the miller, Mrs. Olport at the general shop, Bob Canning, the carrier. Oh, dear me, yes, they all remembered him, were quite courteous, glad he had done well at the war, got through safely, well, well. And soon the story got round. Old face has returned, old face, the boy who murdered his father. The novelty of his reappearance and return soon wore off, and he knew that he was held in distrust in the village. He wandered far afield, and eventually obtained employment at a brickworks at Keeble, four miles down the valley, towards Blazing Kilstoke. 
Here the rumours concerning him gradually percolated, but they carried little weight or significance. He was a good workman, and time subdues all things. Then the strangest miracle happened to Caleb Fryatt. He was nearly thirty, hard-bitten, battered, ill-mannered, with a scar from a bullet on his left cheek, little money, no prospects and no ambition, an unattractive chunk of a man. But what should we all do if love itself were not the greatest miracle of all? Annie Tilly was by no means a beauty herself, but she was not without attraction. She had a round, bright, red, ingenuous face, a heavily built figure with rather high shoulders and long arms. She was a year older than Caleb and inclined to be deaf, but there was a transparent honesty and simplicity about her. One could see that she would be honest, loyal, and true to all her purposes. She was the daughter of the postman at Blazing Kilstoke. She and Caleb used to meet in the evenings and wander the lanes together. They did not appear to converse very much, but they would occasionally laugh and give each other a hearty push. To her father's disgust, these attentions led to marriage the following year. They went to live in a tiny cottage on the outskirts of Keeble, ten minutes' bicycle ride from the works. Anne made an excellent wife. She seemed to understand and adapt herself to her husband's idiosyncrasies. She kept the cottage spotlessly clean, tended his clothes and kept him in clean linen, cooked well and studied all his little wants and peculiarities. She found time to attend to the garden, grow her own vegetables and even see after a dozen fowls. Caleb had never enjoyed such material comfort. In the evening they would sit either side of the fire, he with his pipe and she with her sewing. They were an unusually silent couple. Apart from her deafness, they never seemed prompted to exchange more than cursory remarks about the weather, their food or some matter of local gossip. In the summer they sat in the garden, and watching the blue smoke from his pipe curl away into the amber light of the setting sun, Caleb felt that he had reached a haven after a restless storm. He worked remorselessly hard at the brickworks, and in two years' time was made a kiln foreman, receiving good wages. Malevolent people still whispered the story concerning the boy who murdered his father, and pointed an accusing finger at the back of his bulky form, but no one dared to remind Anne of that tragic happening. She knew the full details of it quite well, and woe to any unfortunate individual who dared to suggest that her man was in the wrong. In course of time he built a barn and a tool-shed, and they bought an adjoining orchard. They kept pigs, and then a pony and trap, and on Thursdays Anne would drive to market and sell eggs and chickens and apples. Oh yes, they were becoming a prosperous pair. Caleb had surely outlived the ugly vicissitudes of his fate. Was he happy? Was he completely satisfied? Who shall say? The promptings from the soul come from some deep root no one has fathomed. He was conscious of a greater peace than he had ever known. He sometimes hummed a quite unrecognisable tune as he went about his work. The mornings enchanted him with gossamer webs gleaming with dew swinging between the flowers but the eyes still sometimes appeared to be seeking one knows not what. They had been married five years and seven months when the child was born. It came as a great surprise to Caleb. He had hardly dared to visualise such an eventuality. 
What a to-do there was in the cottage. Another room to be prepared, strange garments suddenly appearing upon the line in the kitchen, a visiting nurse somewhat important and discursive. A boy, ho, thought Caleb, as he trundled along on his bicycle the following morning. A boy who will grow up and perhaps become like himself. Well, that was very strange, very remarkable. Most remarkable that such a possibility had never occurred to him. All day long, and for nights and weeks after, he thought about the boy who was going one day to be a man like himself. The thought at first worried and perplexed him. Was he... Had he been the kind of man the world would want perpetuated? He felt the fierce censure and distrust mankind had always lavished upon himself, beginning to focus on the boy, and gradually the protective sense developed in him to a desperate degree. The boy should have better chances than he ever had. The boy should be protected, cared for, shown the way of things. Caleb ruminated. His wife became very dear to him. He was a man on the threshold of revelation. But before his eyes had fully opened to the realisation of all that this meant to him, a wayward gust of fever shattered the spectrum. The little fellow died when barely four months old. For a time, Caleb was most deeply concerned for the health of his wife, who was a victim of the same scourge, but as she gradually recovered, a feeling of unendurable melancholy crept over him. He began to observe the grey perspective of his life, its past and future. When Anne was once more normal, their intercourse became more taciturn than ever. There fell between them long, empty silences. There were times when he regarded her with boredom, almost with aversion. The years would roll on. Wonder spirit would assail him. He would be tempted to pick up his cap and go forth and seek some port, where a ship under ballast might be preparing to essay the vast insecurity of heaving waters. But something told him that that would be cruel. His wife's love for him was the most moving experience of his life, far greater than his love for her. She was middle-aged now, and her deafness was more pronounced than ever. Once she went away to stay with her father for a few days. The morning after she left, a wall in the brickyard collapsed and crushed his right foot. He was carried home in excruciating pain. A neighbour came in and attended him, and they fetched the doctor. They wanted to send for his wife, but he told them not to bother her. All night he was delirious, and for the next two days and nights he went through a period of torment. As the fever abated, a deep feeling of depression crept over him. He began to yearn for his wife profoundly. The neighbour, an elderly woman, wife of the local corn chandler, was kindness itself. But everything she did was just wrong. How could she know the way Caleb liked things, and he lying there silent and uncomplaining? On the third evening, Anne arrived. She had heard the news. She came bustling into the cottage, dropped her bag, pressed her lips to his. Silly Billy, why didn't you send for me? Silly Billy. That was her favourite term of raillery when he had behaved foolishly. He choked back a desire to cry with relief. There's nothing, nothing to bother about. But a feeling of deep contentment crept over him. 
His eyes regarded her thick, plump figure moving busily but quietly about the room. There would be nothing now to disturb or annoy him. Everything would be done just, just as he liked it. She deftly rearranged the positions of tables and cups and curtains. As the evening wore on, she hovered above him, watching his every little movement, like a tigress watching over its cub. She eased the pillow, stroked his hair, and by some adroit manoeuvres relieved the pressure on his throbbing leg. A deep sense of tranquillity permeated him. For the first time for three days he felt the desire to sleep. The cottage seemed so inordinately quiet, secure. Once, when she was stooping near the chair by the bed, he seized her rough, strong forearm and pulled her to him. He believed he slept at last with her cheek pressed against his own. They treated him very well at the brickworks, and his wages were paid every week during his absence. It was nearly two months before he could get about again, and the doctors said he must expect to have a permanent limp. Summer vanished in the October mists, and a long winter dragged through its course. Spring again. Its pulse a little feebler than the old days. Well, well, what could a man expect? Some of the old desires raised their heads and tugged at his heartstrings. He was very happy. On and off, a little soiled, perhaps, by the stress of bitter years, a little more ordinary, a little more sociable. He sometimes visited the green man, and would drink beer with Mr. White, the corn chandler, and old Tom Smithick. And after a glass or two, he would be quite a social acquisition, and would be inclined to boast a little of his deeds in the Great War and of his adventures in foreign lands. No harm in it. Not such a bad sort, old face, the boy who murdered his father. Hey ho But how the years ravage us! "'Twas but a while when things were so-and-so, and now... "'He was forty-four when two disturbing factors came into his life, "'threatening to wreck its calm tenor, and they occurred almost simultaneously. "'There was a girl at the brickworks who came from London. "'She was the manager's secretary, and she worked in his office.' Oh, but she was a smart piece of goods, and the men never tired of discussing her. In the early twenties, distinctly pretty, with a mass of chestnut hair, pert manners, and a wristwatch. Passing through the yards, she would sometimes chat with the men at the kilns, and in their dinner hour she would laugh and joke with them. Their estimate of her was not always expressed in very refined or flattering language. Old Ingleton, the timekeeper, swore that she had given him the glad eye, but as one of his own eyes was glass, his confession did not carry great weight. She had never singled Caleb out for any particular attention, though she was always friendly with him. The cataclysm came upon him quite suddenly, one day in late September. He was digging a trench by a mound covered with nettles and a few tall sunflowers. It was a glorious day, and the earth smelt good. He rested upon his spade and was enjoying the pleasant tranquillity of the scene when the girl came round a corner and looked at him. She smiled and exclaimed, "'Lovely day, Mr. Fryat." He instinctively touched his hat and said, "'Aye!' That was the end of the conversation. But Caleb watched her walking up the narrow path towards the manager's shanty, and some restless fever stirred within him. She was unique. He had seen such women from a distance, smartly apparelled, walking about the streets of London and Cape Town, 
but he had always looked upon them as creatures of a different world from his own, and hardly given them a thought. But here was one smiling at him, speaking to him. After all, she was not so remote. She was a girl, indeed a working girl, quite accessible and friendly. And what a lithesome, dainty figure! What an appealing, pretty face! Those lips! Ugh, a large worm wiggled free from the side of the trench, and, quite unreasonably, he cut it in half with his spade. From that moment forward, Caleb began to think about Agnes Fairham. Alas, he began to dream about her also. She was a note of bright and vivid colour in the drab monotony of his life. He began to lie in wait for her, to force his clumsy attentions upon her, and she did not seem to resent it unduly. The affair became an obsession. His faculty of reasoning had never been considerable. In some dim way he felt that there was the solution of all those buried yearnings and thwarted desires which had accompanied him through life. Here was an explanation. He was content to be held by the experience, without formulating any plan or definite resolution. Whether the girl would ultimately succumb to his solicitations, whether she would go away with him, and if so, how he was to manage to keep her? Moreover, how he was to face the appalling cruelty of his own attitude towards Anne? All of these questions he put behind him. For the moment, they appeared immaterial to the blinding obsession. One day, while still in this indeterminate mood, he went home, as usual, to his midday dinner. As he dismounted his bicycle and leant it against the garden fence, Anne came out of the cottage and said, Caleb, there's a gentleman to see you. He went inside and beheld a small, keen-faced, elderly man, who nodded to him and said, Mr. Caleb Fryatt? Aye. The little man examined him closely. I will come straight to the business I have in hand. I am the head clerk of Rogers, Mason and Freeman, solicitors of Blazing Kilstoke. You, I believe, are the only child of Stephen and Mary Fryatt, late of Cravenford? Aye. You may be aware that your father had a brother named Leonard in Nova Scotia? I've heard tell on he. Your uncle died last year. He left a little property and no will. My principles are of the opinion that you are the lawful legatee. They would be obliged if you would pay them a visit, so the matter may be fully determined. Here is my card. Caleb stared dully at the piece of pasteboard, but Anne, who had entered the cottage just previously, asked to have the business explained to her. Caleb shouted in her ear. Then she turned to the lawyer and said, And how much money did his uncle Leonard leave, do you know, sir? Uh, quite without prejudice, and entirely between ourselves, I believe it is the matter of approximately four thousand pounds. It took the whole of the afternoon for this news thoroughly to penetrate the skull of the fortunate legatee. Indeed, it was not until he had had a pint of beer at the Green Man on the way home that the full significance came home to him. It is to be regretted that after his supper he returned to the Green Man, and for the first time in his life Mr. Caleb Fryatt got drunk. He stood drinks lavishly and indiscriminately. He told everyone his news. The amount became a little distorted. It may have been due to the lawyer's use of the word approximately. This orgy acted upon him disastrously. As he reeled up the village street, only one vision became clear to him. Agnes. He could take her away 
buy her a mansion and smart frocks. He could take her to hotels and theatres in London. At the same time, he could settle money on Anne. He was a millionaire. The world belonged to him. With a tremendous effort, he controlled his feet and voice when he reached the cottage, but he went to bed at once. In the morning he had a headache, and Anne bound his head in a damp linen handkerchief and brought him tea. By Monday, everyone in the countryside from Cravenford to Billows Weir knew that Old Face, the ugly man, known as the boy who murdered his father, had come in for a large fortune left by an uncle in Canada. The first person he met in the brickworks on Monday was Agnes, who came up to him and held out her hand. "'I believe we are to congratulate you, Mr. Fryatt. He smiled at her foolishly and held her hand an unnecessarily long time. There was no doubt she had taken to him. She liked him. Could he stir her deeper emotion? The weeks went by in a dream. He visited the lawyers. Everything was in order. They even offered to advance him money. He could not visualise the full dimensions of his fortune. Neither had he the power to act on it. He still went on at the brickworks and the cottage, listening to Anne's sensible admonitions to invest the money in small amounts, so as to have a nest egg for their old age. But he could not detach this miracle of wealth from the figure of Agnes. They had come together. They belonged to each other. Fantastic phenomena jerking him violently out of the deep rut of his existence. One day he went into the town and bought a gold locket, set with blue stones. He gave four pounds ten for it. He waited for Agnes that evening and gave it to her. He had been in an agony as to whether she would accept it, but to his delight she received it with gratitude and thanked him bewitchingly. This seemed to bind her to him indissolubly. A few evenings later he met her in the lane. There was no one about. Without a word he took her in his arms and pressed his lips to hers. She gasped and spluttered, Oh, Mr. Fry, please, no! But she wasn't angry. Oh, no, not really angry, just provocative, more alluring than ever. They met frequently after that, in secret disused corners of the brickfield, in the lanes at night. He bought her more presents, and one Saturday they went secretly to a fair at Molsham and only returned by the last train. The men naturally began to get wind of this illicit courtship, but as far as he knew, no rumour had penetrated the deafness of Anne. He was drifting desperately beyond care in either respect. Two months of this intensive worship, and the madness was upon him. He said, "'You must come with me. We will run away.' "'Where, Caleb?' We'll go to London. Where should we stay? At swell hotels. We'll have a carriage. I'll buy frocks and jewels. The girl's eyes narrowed. What about your wife? I'll make it all right. I'll settle some money on her. But Agnes was not so easily won. Oh, dear, no. There were tears and emotion. You see... She was only a young and innocent girl. Suppose he deserted her. What assurance had she? This scheming and plotting went on for weeks. At length they came to an agreement. Agnes would go to London with him if he would first settle a thousand pounds upon her. It was very cheap at the price, 
and a fair and reasonable bargain. One Saturday they journeyed together to his lawyers at Blazing Kilstoke. The deed was drawn up, and they both signed various papers. The elopement was fixed for the following Saturday. All the week Caleb walked like a man unconscious of his surroundings. The purposes of his life were to be fulfilled. True, he had odd moments of misgiving. He dared not think about Anne. Also, at times he had gloomy forebodings concerning London hotels, how to behave, whether the people would laugh at him, what clothes to wear, whether Agnes would quickly sicken of him. But still, he had pledged himself. He jingled the money in his pocket. His destiny. Friday was a disastrous day. It was cold and damp, and to his disgust he awoke with a severe twinge of rheumatism in his left shoulder. It made him irritable and nervous all day. Agnes was very preoccupied. He had advanced her some money to buy frocks, and she went backwards and forward to her lodgings with large cardboard boxes. He had selected the morrow because Anne was going away to spend a few days with her father. In the afternoon his rheumatism became worse, and he became aware of the symptoms of a feverish chill. He left off work at his usual time and cycled home. The cottage was all in darkness. He lighted the lamp. Anne had left his supper ready for him on the tray. The little room looked neat and tidy. She had also left a note for him. He picked it up carelessly and held it under the lamp. This is what he read. Caleb, dear, I hear you've made some money over to Agnes Fairham and that you are wishful to go away with her. My dear, I do not want to interfere with your happiness. I thought I'd been a good wife to you, but you know best. I'm going to my father and I shall not come back. Please God you may be happy. Your broken-hearted wife, Anne. Bless you, dear, for all you have been to me and the happiness you have given me. And Caleb buried his face in his hands. Without touching his supper, he carried the lamp into the bedroom and went to bed. Curse it, how his teeth were chattering. He would have liked a little brandy, but there was none in the cottage, and there was no one to fetch it. He wrapped himself up and rolled over. The interminable night began. What a weak fool he was! All the experiences and temptations of his life crowded upon him and tortured him. Idle dreams, idle dreams! His shoulder ached insufferably. If Am were here, she would rub it with that yellow oil. He could not rub his own shoulder and back. And then she would wrap it up in a thick shawl and say, Silly Billy, you must be careful of the damp. He could visualise her moving about the room, arranging the curtain so there was no draught, stirring something in a cup, giving those little dexterous pokes to the bedclothes which meant so much, sitting placidly by the window, his coarse woollen socks in her hand. She loved darning his socks, and doing things for him, even all the unpleasant ugly things of domestic life. He ought to have some soup or gruel or something, but he could not be bothered to make it. He turned out the lamp, and all night long Caleb turned and fretted, and strangely enough he gave little thought to Agnes. She was now becoming the unreality, the vain fancy, a feather drifting on the ocean. She was nothing to him. She had no part in that deep consciousness amongst whose folds he had sought so desperately to find inner relief. 
What was it? Where was it? Towards dawn he slept fitfully, struggling to keep awake on account of the disturbing dreams that crowded upon him. When things at last became visible, the first thing he was aware of was an old shawl of his wife's on a nail by the door, and the cap that she wore to do the housework in. The things became to him an emblem of the love she bore him, and the truth came to him with the rising of the sun. Love, the deep secret her hand had sought, the love that struggles to endure through any conditions, the love that as far as human nature is concerned is permanent and indestructible. He observed its action upon his own career, his mother's love for his father, a love which he had so tragically misinterpreted. Later, his love for his country, which had crept upon him across the years and whispered to him across the endless waste of waters. And lastly, the love that existed between his wife and himself, a love that was so near and familiar to him that he could not always see it. He sighed, and the dreams no longer worried him. It must have been some hours later that he awoke and made himself some tea. He was still shaky, and his shoulder hurt, so he went back to bed. In the middle of the morning he heard the latch of the front door click, and his heart beat rapidly. She has come back, he thought, and he heard someone moving in the passage. His door opened, and on the threshold of the room stood Agnes. It was queer that on observing her, his first thought was with regard to his teeth. During the war he had lost three front teeth. A loving government had presented him with a plate and three false teeth, which he always wore in daytime, but which at night, on Anne's advice, he always kept in a glass of water by the side of the bed. He stretched out his hand for the teeth, and then he felt that it would be ridiculous putting the plate in, so he left the matter alone. She advanced into the room, and neither of them spoke. It is difficult to know precisely what attitude Agnes had resolved to take, but the appearance and atmosphere of that room may have altered or modified it. She merely grinned rather uncomfortably at Caleb. He could not have been an attractive sight. He had slept badly, and he had not washed or shaved. He was wearing a coarse woollen nightgown, and his three front teeth were missing. Perhaps it occurred to her abruptly that in the round of life one has to take the unshorn early morning with the gaily bedecked evening, and she was already wondering whether the combination was worth while. In any case, she merely said, Well? And Caleb replied, Hello. And both looked a little ashamed then, and Agnes glanced out of the window as if dreading someone's approach. As he did not speak further, she turned and said, You're not coming, then? He turned his face to the wall and answered, No. There was a very definite expression of relief on the girl's face. She was very smartly dressed in a tailor-made coat and skirt. She edged toward the door, and then she said in a mildly querulous voice, I knew you'd back out of it. Caleb sat up and exclaimed feelingly, I'm sorry, Agnes. This seemed to quite appease her, and she said, Anything you want, Caleb, before I go? The man stared thoughtfully at the ceiling before replying, uh, Wait a minute, Agnes. He took a pencil and a sheet of paper and wrote out a telegram addressed to his wife. Come back, dear, I want you. The girl took up the telegram and read it through thoughtfully. Then she once more edged towards the door. She fumbled with the latch. Suddenly she turned and said, 
That will be eleven pence. Who? Eh? That will be eleven pence for the telegram. Oh, aye, that's it. Yes, eleven pence. He fumbled with his trousers on the chair by the side of the bed and produced a shilling. Alas, I haven't got any change. Don't bother about the penny. She took the shilling and went back to the door. Goodbye, Caleb. Goodbye. When she had gone, he thought it was rather queer of her to ask for the shilling. He had already given her a thousand pounds and many frocks and presents. She might in any case have offered to give him the penny change. However, he soon forgot her in the fever of anxiety he was in as to the return of his wife. All day long no one came near the cottage. The day was wet, and a thick white mist drifted with the rain. He could not trouble to light the fire. He ate some bread and cheese at midday, and vainly tried to rub his shoulder with the oil. Soon after five it began to be dark again. He was in a terror of remorse and fear. Had he destroyed the lamp of his happiness? He buried his face in the pillow and groaned, I didn't understand, I didn't understand. He began to feel so weak, he was losing sense of time. He awakened once with a start. The room seemed suddenly filled with an enveloping comfort. He held out his arms. He felt those wet cheeks pressed close to his. That voice so dear and familiar to him was whispering in his ear, Silly Billy, I knew ye would send for me. End of Face The Brown Wallet from Miss Bracegirdle and Others by Stacey Armonier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Max. The Brown Wallet Giles Meeklejohn was a beaten man, huddled in a corner of a third-class railway carriage on the journey from Epsom to London. He sullenly reviewed the unfortunate series of episodes which had brought him into the position he found himself dogged by bad luck. Thirty-seven years of age, married, a daughter ten years old, nothing attained, his debts exceeding his assets, and now out of work. He had tried, too. A little pampered in his upbringing, when the crisis came he had faced it manfully. When, during his very first year at Oxford, the news came of his father's bankruptcy and sudden death from heart failure, he immediately went up to town and sought a situation in any capacity. His mother had died many years previously, and his only sister was married to a missionary in Burma. His accomplishments at that time? Well, he could play cricket and squash rackets. He knew a smattering of Latin and a smudge of French. He remembered a few dates in history, and he could add up and subtract, a little unreliably. He was good-looking, genial, and of excellent physique. He had no illusions about the difficulties which faced him. His father had always been a kind of practical visionary. Connected with big insurance interests, he was a man of large horizons, profound knowledge, and great ideals. Around his sudden failure and death, there had always clung an atmosphere of mystery. That he had never expected to fail, and was unprepared for death a week before it happened, is certain. He had had plans for Giles, which up until that time he had had no opportunity of putting into operation. The end must have been cyclonic. Through the intervention of friends, Giles obtained a situation as clerk in an insurance office, his wages amounting to fifteen shillings a week, a sum he managed to live on. In the evening he attended classes, 
and studied shorthand and typewriting. At first, the freshness of this experience, aided by youth and good health, stimulated him. But as time went on, he began to realise that he had chosen work for which he was utterly unsuited. He worked hard, but made no progress. He had not a mathematical mind. He was slow in the uptake. The chances of promotion were remote. The men around him seemed so quick and clever. At the end of two years, he decided to resign and try something else. If only he had been taught a profession. After leaving the insurance office, he went through various experiences. Working at a seedsman's nursery, going round with a circus, attempting to get on the stage and failing, working his passage out to South Africa, more clerking, nearly dying from enteric through drinking polluted water, working on an ostrich farm, returning to England as a male nurse to a young man who was mentally deficient. It was not until he met Minting that he achieved any success at all. They started a press-cutting agency in two rooms in Bloomsbury. Minting was clever, and Giles borrowed fifty pounds, from whom we will explain later. Strangely enough, the press-cutting agency was a success. After the first six months, they began to do well. It was at that time that he met Eleanor. She was secretary to Sir Herbert Woolley, the well-known actor-manager, and she happened to call one day concerning the matter of press cuttings for her employer. From the very first moment, there was never any question on either side but that both he and she had met their fate. Neither had there been an instant's regret on either side ever since. They were completely devoted. With the business promising well, he married her within three months. It is probable that if the business had not existed, he would have done the same. They went to live in a tiny flat in Maida Vale, and a child was born the following year. A period of unclouded happiness followed. There was no fortune to be made out of press cuttings, but a sufficient competence to keep Eleanor and the child in reasonable comfort. Everything progressed satisfactorily for three years, and then, one July morning, the blow fell. At that time, he and Minting were keeping a junior clerk. Giles and Eleanor had been away to the sea for a fortnight's holiday. Minting was to go the day of their return. When Giles arrived at the office, he found the clerk alone. To his surprise, he heard that Minting had not been there himself for a fortnight. He did not have to wait long to find the solution of the mystery. The first hint came in the discovery of a blank count foil. Minting had withdrawn every penny of their small capital and vanished. Giles did not tell his wife. He made a desperate effort to pull the concern together, but in vain. There were a great number of outstanding debts, and he had just nine shillings when he returned from his holiday. He rushed round and managed to borrow a pound or two here and there, sufficient to buy food and pay off the clerk, but he quickly foresaw that the crash was inevitable. He had not the business acumen of minting, and no one seemed prepared to invest money in a bankrupt press-cutting agency. In the midst of his troubles, the original source of the fifty pounds, upon which he had started the business, wrote peremptorily, demanding the money back. He went there and begged and pleaded, but it was obvious that the original source looked upon him as a waster and ne'er-do-well. He went bankrupt and Eleanor had to be told. She took it in just the way he knew she would take it. She said, Never mind, darling, we'll soon get on our feet again. She had been a competent secretary with a knowledge of French, bookkeeping shorthand and typewriting. She set to work and obtained a situation herself, 
as secretary to the manager of a firm of wallpaper manufacturers, housing the child during the day with a friendly neighbour. Giles was idle the whole of August. They gave up the flat and went into lodgings. In September, he got work as a clerk to a stationer. His salary was 30 shillings a week, a pound less than his wife was getting. He felt the situation bitterly. Poor Eleanor, how he had let her down. When he spoke about it, though, she only laughed and said, If our troubles are never anything worse than financial ones, darling, I shan't mind. They continued to be only financial ones till the following year, when Eleanor became very ill. She gave birth to a child that died. In a desperate state, Giles again approached the original source. After suffering considerable recrimination and bullying, he managed to extract another ten pounds, which quickly vanished. It was three months before Eleanor was well enough to resume work, and during that time they lived in a state of penury. Giles lived almost entirely on tea and bread, and became very run-down and thin. He pretended to Eleanor that he had had an increase, and that he had a good lunch every day, so that all the money he earned could be spent on her and the baby. In the meantime, he dissected desperately that grimmest of all social propositions, the unskilled labour market. If only he had been taught to be a bootmaker, a plumber or a house painter, he would have been better off. Manners may make men, but they don't make money, and one has to make money to live. He became envious of his fellow clerks and shop assistants who had never tasted the luxurious diet of a public school training. That he had brains he was fully aware, but they had never been trained in any special direction. They were, moreover, the kind of brains that do not adapt themselves to commercial ends. He had always had a great affection for his father, but he began to nurture a resentment against his memory. His father had treated him badly, bringing him up to a life of ease and assurance and then deserting him. It would be idle and not very interesting to trace the record of his experiences during the next years, up to the time when we find him in the train on the way back from Epsom. It is a dreary story, the record of a series of dull, underpaid jobs, a few bright gleams of hope, even days and nights of complete happiness, then dull reactions, strain, worry, hunger, nervous fears, blunted ambitions and thwarted desires. Through it all, the only thing that remained unalterably bright and inspiring was his wife's face. Not once did she flinch, not once did she lose hope. Her constant slogan, Never mind, old darling, we'll soon be on our feet again was ever in his ears, buoying him up through his darkest hours. And again he was out of work, again Eleanor was not well, and again he had been to the original source. The original source was his uncle, his father's brother. He was a thin, acid old gentleman, known in commercial circles as a money maniac. Living alone in a large house at Epsom, with all kinds of telephonic communications with the city, he thought and dreamed of nothing at all but his mistress, money. Between him and Giles's father had always existed a venomous hatred, far more pronounced on the side of his uncle than of his father. It had dated back many years. When his father died, and Giles appealed to his uncle, the old gentleman appeared thoroughly to enjoy giving him five pounds as an excuse for a lecture and a subtly conveyed sneer at his father's character. He was a very wealthy man, 
and he could easily have launched Giles into the world by putting him through the training for one of the professions, but he preferred to dole out niggardly little bits of charity and advice, and to boast that he himself was a self-made man who had had no special training. No, thought Giles, but you have an instinct for making money. I haven't. You don't have to train a duck to swim. Naturally, they very quickly quarrelled, and his uncle seemed to rejoice in his failures. It was only in his most desperate positions that he appealed to him again. Lying back in the dimly lighted railway carriage, he kept on visualising his uncle's keen, malevolent eyes, the thrust of the pointed chin. The acid tones of his voice echoed through his brain. It's quite time, my lad, you pulled yourself together. You ought to have made your fortune by now. Don't imagine I'm always going to help you. Giles had humbled his pride for his wife and his child's sake. He had spent the night at his uncle's, and by exercising his utmost powers of cajolery, he had managed to exhort three pounds. Three pounds! And the rent overdue, bills pressing, his wife unwell, and he out of work. What was he going to do? The train rumbled into Waterloo Station without any satisfactory answer being arrived at. He pulled his bag out from under the seat and stepped slowly out of the carriage. Walking along the platform, it suddenly occurred to him that he was feeling weak and exhausted. I hope to God I'm not going to be ill, he thought. The bag, which contained only his night things and a change of clothes, seemed unbearably heavy. A slight feeling of faintness came over him as he passed the ticket collector. I believe I shall have to have a cab, flashed through him. Two important-looking men got out of a taxi which had just driven up. Giles engaged it, and having given his address, he stepped in and sank back, exhausted, onto the seat. It was very dark in the cab, and he lay huddled in the corner, a beaten man. Everything appeared distant and dim and unimportant. He had hardly eaten any lunch, and his uncle seemed to have arranged that he should leave his house just before dinner. It was late, and he was hungry and overwrought. The cab turned a corner sharply, and Giles lurched and thrust his hand onto the other end of the seat to prevent himself falling. As he did so, his knuckles brushed against an object. Quite apathetically, he felt to see what it was. He picked it up and held it near the window. It was a brown leather wallet with a circular brass lock. He regarded it dubiously, and for an instant hesitated whether he should tell the driver to go back to the station. The wallet presumably belonged to one of those two important-looking gentlemen who had got out. But would it be possible to find them? By that time they will probably have gone off by train. No, the right thing to do was to give it up to the police, of course. It was a fat wallet, and he sat there with it in his hand, ruminating. He wondered what it contained. Quite easy just to have a squint, anyway. He tried to slip the latch, but it wouldn't open. It was locked. It is difficult to determine the extent to which this knowledge affected him. If it had not been locked, Giles Meeklejohn's immediate actions, and indeed his future career, might have been entirely different. It irritated him that the wallet was locked, tantalised him. If it was locked, it meant that it contained something pretty useful. All round the park he lay back in the cab, hugging the wallet like one in a trance. A desperate, beaten man holding a fat wallet in his hand. Contrary forces were struggling within his tired mind. Going up Park Lane, one of those forces seemed to succumb to the other. 
Almost in a dream, he leant out of the cab and said quietly to the driver, Drive to the Trocadero. I think I'll get a bit of supper first. Arriving there, he paid the cabman, concealed the wallet in his overcoat, and went in. He entered a lavatory and locked himself in. With unruffled deliberation, he took out a penknife and began to saw away at the leather round the lock. I just want to have a squint, he kept on mentally repeating. It took him nearly a quarter of an hour to get the wallet open, and when he did his heart was beating like a sledgehammer. The wallet contained eight thick packets of one-pound treasury notes. He feverishly computed the number which each packet contained, and decided that it must be two hundred and fifty. In other words, he had two thousand pounds worth of ready cash in his possession. A desperate beaten man with a wife and child, hungry, out of work. Two thousand pounds. There seemed no question about it all then. One side of the scale was too heavily weighted. He took seventeen of the one-pound notes and put them into his pocket-book. The rest he divided up in the pockets of his overcoat, where he also concealed the wallet. He went up into the bar and ordered a double brandy and soda. He drank it in two gulps and went out and hailed another taxi. On the way home he stopped at a caterer's and bought a cold fowl, some pressed beef, new rolls, cheese, a box of chocolates and a bottle of wine. Then he drove homeward. Up to this point his actions seemed to have been controlled by some subconscious force. So far as his normal self was concerned, he had hardly thought at all. But as he began to approach his own neighbourhood, his own wife, the realisation of what he had done, what he was doing, came home to him. It was practically stealing. It is stealing, you know. Yes. But what would anyone else have done in that position? He couldn't let his wife and child starve. There was only one thing he was afraid of. His wife's eyes. She must never know. He would have to be cunning, circumspect. He must get rid of the wallet, conceal the notes from his wife, eke them out in driblets, pretend he was making money somehow. But the wallet? He couldn't leave it in the cab. It would be found, and the cabman would give evidence. He mustn't drive home at all. He must get out again, think again. Between Paddington and Maida Vale runs a canal. Happy thought, a canal. He stopped at the bridge and dismissed the man again, tipping him lavishly. The banks of the canal were railed off. It was only possible to get near enough to throw anything in from the bridge. Thither he walked at a rapid stride. The feeling of exhaustion had passed. He was tingling with excitement. He looked eagerly about for a stone and cursed these modern arrangements of wooden pavements. There were no stones near the canal. Never mind, the thing would probably sink. If it didn't, who could trace its discovery to his actions? The point was to get rid of it unseen. He reached the bridge. A few stray people were passing backward and forward. He must wait till everyone was out of sight. He hung about, gripping his portmanteau in one hand and the wallet in his right hand overcoat pocket. He crossed the bridge once, but still seeing dark figures about, he had to return. Why not throw it now? No, there was someone watching in the road opposite. Might be a policeman. The police. Never had cause to feel frightened at the police before. There would be a splash. Someone might come out of the darkness. A deep voice. What was that you threw in the canal? No, no, he couldn't do it. The bridge was too exposed, too much of a fairway. 
He hurried off, walking rapidly down side streets in the direction of his home. At last an opportunity presented itself. Shabby, deserted little street, a low stone wall enclosing a meagre garden. Not a soul in sight. Like a flash, he slipped the wallet over the wall and dropped it. Instantaneously, he looked up at the house connected with the garden. A man was looking out of the first-floor window, watching him. He turned and walked quickly back. He thought he heard a call. At the first turning, he ran, the portmanteau banging against his leg and impeding his progress. He only ceased running because people stopped and looked at him suspiciously. "'It's all right. It's all right,' he kept saying to himself. "'I've got rid of it.' Yes, he was rid of that danger, but there loomed before him the more insidious difficulty of concealing the notes. His pockets bulged with them. When he arrived home, Eleanor would run out into the landing and throw her arms around him. He could almost hear the tones of her gentle voice saying, "'Whatever have you got in your pockets, darling?' If he put them in the portmanteau, she would be almost certain to open it, or she would be in the room when he went to unpack. Very difficult to conceal anything from Eleanor. She knew all about him. Every little thing about him interested her. Nothing in their rooms was locked up. Moreover, she was very observant, methodical and practical. Someone had called her psychic, but this was only because she thought more quickly than most people, and had unerring intuitions. Giles would have to be very cunning. His mental energies were so concerned with the necessity for deceiving Eleanor that the moral aspect of his position was temporarily blurred. He plunged on through the darkness, his mind working rapidly. At the corner of their meagre street, he was tempted to stuff the notes in a pillar-box and hurry home. "'Don't be a fool,' said the other voice. "'Here is comfort and luxury interminably, not only for yourself, for the others.' He went boldly up to the house and let himself in. He heard other lodgers talking in the front ground-floor room. He hurried by and reached his own landing. To his relief, Eleanor's voice came from the room above. "'Is that you, darling?' He dumped the bag down, and in a flash had removed his overcoat and hung it on a peg in a dark corner. Then he called out, "'Oh, old girl, everything all right?' Within a minute his wife's arms were round him, and he exclaimed with forced triumph, I touched the old boy for twenty pounds. I've brought home a chicken and things. Oh, how splendid! A chicken? Rather extravagant, isn't it, darling? One must live, dear angel. Her confidence and trust in him, her almost childish glee over the gay feast, her solicitude in his welfare her anxiety that little Anna should have some chicken but keep the sweets till the morrow, her voice later crooning over the child. All these things mocked his conscience. But he couldn't afford to have a conscience. He couldn't afford to say, I stole this and more. He was eager for the attainment of that last instance, crooning over the child. Whilst he was putting the little girl to bed, he crept out into the passage and extracted the packets of notes from his overcoat pocket. He took them into the sitting room and wrapped them in brown paper. He wrote on the outside, stationery. Then he stuffed the parcel at the back of a cupboard where they kept all kinds of odds and ends. That'll have to do for tonight, he thought. I'm too tired to think of anything better. When she came down, he enlarged the claims of his exhaustion. He had a bit of a head, he explained, 
just as well to turn in early. In the darkness he clung to her fearfully, like a child in terror of separation. It was not till she was sleeping peacefully that the enormity of his offence came home to him. If he were found out, it would kill her. He remembered her expression. If our troubles are never anything worse than financial ones, darling, I shan't mind. Good God, what had he done? He could call it what he liked, but crudely speaking, it was just stealing. He had stolen. He was a criminal, a felon. If found out, it meant arrest, trial, imprisonment. All these horrors he had only vaguely envisaged as concerning a different type of person to himself. In the rough and tumble of his life, he had never before done anything criminal, never anything even remotely dishonest. And she, Eleanor, what would she think of him? It would destroy her love, destroy her life, ruin the child. He must get up, go into the other room, and what? What could he do with the notes? Burn them? Eleanor had that mother's curious faculty for profound, but at the same time watchful sleep. If he got out of bed, she would be aware of it. If he went into the next room and began burning things, she would be instantly alert. What's that burning, darling? An ever-loving wife may be an embarrassment when one is not quite playing the game. By destroying the wallet, he had burnt his boats. If he returned the money, he would have to explain what the wallet was doing in a neighbour's garden with the brass lock cut away. Besides, you've already spent some, interjected that other voice. You're horribly in debt. Here's succour. The money probably belongs to some rich corporation. It's not like taking it from the poor. Don't be a fool. Go to sleep. For hours he tossed feverishly, the pendulum of his resolution swinging backward and forward. If he was to keep the money, he would have to invent some imaginary source of income. A fictitious job, perhaps. That would be very difficult, because Eleanor was so solicitous, such a glutton for details concerning himself. He might have made out that his uncle had given him a much larger sum of money. But in that case, there was the danger that, in her impetuous manner, Eleanor might have written to the old man, and the old man would smell a rat. Doubtless the affair of the lost wallet would be in the papers the next day, and wouldn't the old man be delighted to bring it home to Giles? There was nothing to be done but to trust to fate. The milk carts were clattering in the road before he slept. It was hours later that he heard Anna's merry little laugh and his wife's voice saying, "'Hush, darling, Daddy's asleep.' He's very tired. He got up and faced the ordeals of the day. The place at the back of the lumber cupboard seemed the most exposed in the world. He racked his brains for a more suitable spot. But whichever place he thought of, danger seemed to lurk. One never quite knew what Eleanor might do. She was so keen on tidying up and clearing things out. He decided that a crisp walk might clear his mind. He made up the excuse that he was going to the public library to look through the advertisements and went out. He meant to smuggle the parcel of notes out with him, but Eleanor was too much on the spot. She helped him on with his overcoat and said, "'It'll soon be all right again, darling.' Poor Eleanor! What a capacity she had for living! She ought to have married a rich, successful, and clever man. She ought to have had everything a beautiful woman desires. 
Oh. He walked quickly to the nearest newsagents and bought a newspaper. There was nothing in the morning paper about the loss of the wallet. He felt annoyed about this until he realised that of course there wouldn't have been time. It would come out later. And indeed, while standing on the curb, anxiously scrutinising his morning paper, boys came along the street selling the Star and the Evening News. A paragraph in the Star, headed £2,000 left in a taxi, supplied him with the information he needed. It announced that Sir James Cusping, KBE, a director of a well-known bank and a chief cashier, left a wallet containing £2,000 in treasury notes in a taxi at Waterloo Station. The money was the result of a cash transaction concerning certain bank investments. Anyone giving information likely to lead to recovery would be suitably rewarded. It also announced that Scotland Yard had the matter in hand. So far, the information was satisfactory. Sir James Cusping was a notoriously wealthy man, and the chief cashier was hardly likely to be held seriously responsible for a loss for which such an important person was jointly responsible. The bank mentioned was a bank that advertised that its available assets exceeded four hundred million pounds. Two thousand pounds meant less to it than two pence would mean to Giles. No one was hurt by the transfer of this useful sum to his own pocket. The sun was shining. Why be down in the mouth about it? What he had done, he had done, and he must see it through. How could anybody trace the theft to him? The two cabmen? They would be hardly likely to remember his face, and neither of them had driven him home. There was no danger from anyone except Eleanor. A certain fever of dread came over him. She would assuredly turn out that cupboard today and find the packet of stationery. Then what? He hurried back home. Approaching the house, other fears assailed him. He had visions of policemen waiting for him on the other side of the hall door. Damn it, his nerves were going to pot. He opened the door with exaggerated nonchalance. There was no one there, no one up in his rooms except his wife and child. Eleanor was singing. The kettle was on the gas ring, ready for tea. What a cad I am to her, he thought. The condition of frenzied agitation continued till the following afternoon when it reached a crisis. He was feeling all unstrung. Seated alone in their little sitting-room, he was struggling with the resolution to confess everything to Eleanor when she entered the room. He glanced at her and nearly screamed. She was holding up the parcel in her hand. In her cheerful voice, she said, "'What is this parcel marked stationery, darling? I was just turning out the cupboard.' Like an animal driven to bay, he jumped up and almost snatched it from her. The inspiration of despair prompted him to exclaim, Oh, uh, that! Yes, uh, yes, I wanted that. It's something a chap wanted me to get for him. It doesn't belong to me. A chap? A chap? Giles didn't usually refer to chaps. They had no secrets apart. She looked surprised. I was just going to open it. As a matter of fact, we have run out of stationery. Eh? No, no, not that. I must send that back. I'll get some more stationery. He tucked the packet under his arm and went out into the hall. You're not going out at once, said Eleanor, following. Yes, yes, I must post it at once. I'd quite forgotten. He slipped on his coat and went out without his customary embrace. Beads of perspiration were on his brow. That's done it, he muttered in the street. I must never take it back. An extravagant plan formed in his mind. He went to the library and looked at the advertisements in a local paper. 
he took down some addresses in St. John's Wood. In half an hour's time, he was calling on a landlady in a mean street. "'You have a furnished room to let,' he said, when she appeared. "'Yes, sir. Well, it's like this. I'm an author. I want a quiet room to work in during the daytime. "'I've a nice room as would suit you. Come on, then, let me see it, please.' He booked into the room, a shabby little overcrowded apartment. "'I'll be coming in today, he said. "'Very good, sir. What name might it be?' Uh, "'Name? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, John Parsons.' He fled down the street and sought a furnishing establishment. "'I want an oak desk which I can lock up, a good strong lock.' He paid seven pounds ten for the desk, and got it taken round at once on a barrow. He then bought scribbling papers, paper, and ink. He established himself in his room, stuffed the packet of notes in the desk, and locked it. Then he went out into the street again. The fresh air fanned his temples. He almost chuckled. "'By God, why didn't I think of this at first? he reflected. After the life I've led, one forgets the power of money. He felt singularly calm and confident. It was dark when he got home. He kissed Eleanor, and made up an elaborate story about a fellow clerk named Lyle Bristow, who used to work in the same office and whom he had met in the street recently. He had wanted this particular stationery most particularly. He had been to see him, and Bristow was giving him an introduction to a man who might be able to offer him a good situation. The story went down reasonably well, but he thought he detected a pucker of suspicion about his wife's brow. He was too involved now to turn back. The following day he visited his furnished room. He anxiously unlocked the desk, took out the notes, examined them put them back, took them out again, stuffed them into his pocket. Very dangerous, after all, leaving them there. A flimsy lock. There might be a burglary. He had told the landlady that he was an author, and it is true that he spent a great portion of that day inventing fiction. Lies to tell Eleanor. He eventually locked the notes up again and went home. He assumed a somewhat forced air of triumph. He had been successful. Through the influence of Bristow, he had secured a position as a chief cashier to a firm of surgical instrument makers in Camden Town. His salary was to be five pounds a week to commence. Eleanor clapped her hands. Oh, but how lovely, darling! I suppose you can do it. You're such an old silly at figures. He explained that the work was quite simple, and added ironically that the great thing Messrs. Bins and Bins wanted was a man they could trust. Then the narrow life of lies proceeded apace. Every day he went to his room, fingered the notes, took some when he needed them, deliberately invented the names and characters of his fellow workers at Messrs. Bins and Bins, even made up little incidents and stories concerning his daily experiences. The whole affair was so inordinately successful. No further reference was made in the newspapers to the missing wallet, and though Scotland Yard were supposed to have the matter in hand, what could they do? Even if by chance suspicion fell on him, there was nothing incriminating to be found in his lodgings, and not a soul knew the whereabouts of John Parsons. His wife and child were living comfortably. He was gradually paying off his debts. But if the purely material side of his adventure was successful, the same cannot be said of the spiritual. He was torture beyond endurance. Lies bred lies. The moral lapse bred other moral lapses. He was conscious of his own moral degeneration. 
he was ashamed to look his wife in the face. In the evening, when he intended to be gay and cheerful, he sat morosely in the corner, wishing that the night would come and go. In the daytime, he would sit in his room, fretful and desolate. In a mood of despair, he began to set down his experiences in terms of fiction, ascribing his feelings to an imaginary person. Sometimes, when the position became unbearable, he would go out and drink. Often, he would go up to the West End and lunch extravagantly at some obscure restaurant. He came into touch with unsavoury people of the underworld. The marks of his deterioration quickly became apparent to his wife. One morning she said, "'Darling, you're working too hard at that place. You look rotten. Last night, when you came home, you smelt of brandy.' Then she wept a little, a thing she had never done in their days of adversity. He promised not to do such a thing again. He swore that the work was not hard. The firm were very pleased with him and were going to give him a raise. The weeks and months went by, and he struggled to keep straight. But little by little he felt himself slipping back. He managed to write a few things which he sent off to publishers, but for the most part he avoided his room for any length of time and sat about in obscure cafes in Soho, drinking and playing cards. Between himself and his wife a great chasm seemed to be yawning. She was to him the dearest treasure in the world, and he was thrusting her away. In that one weak moment he had destroyed all chance of happiness, hers and his. Too late, too late. In six months' time he found that he had spent nearly five hundred pounds. At this rate, in another eighteen months, it would all be gone, and then what? His character destroyed, his wife broken in health, the child without protection or prospects. One morning he observed his wife glancing in the mirror as she did her hair. It came home to him abruptly that she had aged, aged many years in the last six months. Soon she would be turning grey, middle-aged, old-aged. And he? His hair was thin on top, his face flabby, his organisms becoming inefficient and weak, his nerves eternally on edge. Sometimes he was rude and snappy to her, and he buried his face in the pillow and thought, Oh, my darling, what have I done? What have I done? That day... He concentrated on a great resolve. The thing would have to stop. He would rather be a starving clerk again, rather a bricklayer's navvy, a crossing sweeper, anything. He wandered the streets, hugging his determination. He avoided his old haunts. There must be no compromise. The thing should be cut clean out. He would confess. They would send back the remainder of the money anonymously and start all over again. It was hard, but anything was better than this torture. He returned home early in the afternoon, his face pale and tense. His wife was on the landing. She said, Oh, I was just going to send a telegram on to you. It's from your uncle. He says come at once. A queer little stab at the old instinct of conspiracy went through him. If she had sent the telegram on, it would have come back, no such firm known at this address. What did his uncle want? Come at once? Should he go, or should he make his confession first? I think you ought to go, darling. It sounds important. Very well, then. The confession should be postponed till his return. He caught a train at quarter to four and arrived at his uncle's house in daylight. 
An old housekeeper let him in and said, "'Ah, oh, your uncle's been asking for you. A doctor's here. Is he ill? They say he hasn't long to live. A poor man is in great agony.' He was kept waiting ten minutes. A doctor came out to him, looking very solemn. "'I've just given him an injection of strychnine. He wishes to see you alone.' His uncle was propped up against the pillows, his face unrecognisable except for the eyes which were unnaturally bright. Giles went close up to him and took his hand. The old man's voice was only just audible. He whispered, Quickly, oh, quickly, I shall be going. What is it, uncle? It mustn't come out, see... Mustn't get into the newspapers. Nothing. The disgrace. See, that's why. No checks must pass. All cash transactions. See? What do you want me to do? On that bureau, a, a brown paper parcel. It's yours. All in bonds and cash. See? Twenty eight thousand pounds. It really belongs to your father. I can't explain how I am going. He... Uh, I swindled him. He thought he was... It's all through me. He... Bankrupt death, see? Do you mean my father killed himself? Not exactly, see? Hastened his end. Thought he would get into trouble... Take it, Giles, for God's sake. Let me die in peace. Why did you? Why did you? I loved your mother. Take it, Giles, for God's sake. Oh, this pain. It's coming. God help me. It was very late when Giles arrived home. His wife was in bed. All the way home he had been repeating to himself in a dazed way. Twenty-eight thousand pounds. No, twenty-six thousand. Two thousand to be sent back anonymously to the bank. No need for confession. Twenty-six thousand pounds. Eleanor, Anna, oh, my dears. On the table in the sitting room was a letter from a firm of publishers addressed to Mr. John Parsons. It stated that the firm considered the short novel submitted to be a work of striking promise, and the manager would be glad if Mr. Parsons would call on them. Perhaps I find out what I can do, Giles meditated. Eleanor came into the room in her dressing gown and embraced him. All right, darling? Very much. Uncle has given me twenty-eight, I mean twenty-six thousand pounds. He said he cheated my father out of it. Darling, cheated? How awful! No, there was no need for confession. The sudden wild change in their fortunes got into his blood. He gripped her round the waist and lifted her up. Think of it, old girl, money to live on for ever. A place in the country, eh? You know, your dreams. A bit of land and an old house. Flowers, chickens, dogs, books. A pony, perhaps. What about it? Oh, Giles, I can't realise it. But how splendid, too, about the publisher's letter. Why didn't you tell me you were writing? Why do you call yourself John Parsons? No need for a confession. No, no, let's go to bed. But, oh, to get back to the old intimacy. And so, in the silent night, he told her everything. And the tears she shed upon his burning cheeks gave him the only balm of peace he had enjoyed since the hour he had destroyed the wallet. It was Eleanor's hand which printed in Roman lettering on the outside of a parcel the address of Sir James Cusping, K.B.E. 
Inside were £2,000 in treasury notes, and on a slip of paper in the same handwriting, conscience money, found in a taxi. End of The Brown Wallet End of Miss Bracegirdle and Others by Stacey Armonier